Right. How's everyone? Hello, Peter. How are you? How's everyone? Eating ice cream. Right. Oh, Tivo, eating ice cream because it's uh well middle of the day or something. Is this your breakfast, Tivo? <laughs> Right. Um, well, the way I usually run these sort of things is just uh, basically get everyone to introduce themselves as uh, people come in. Um, and also, if there's, as you do so, if you just sort of uh, ask if there's anything in particular that you wanted to cover. Um, I'm not, not really going to talk much about uh, the previous town hall, other than that it happened on Thursday. So um, since there's a few days before that, um, hopefully everyone's had a chance to catch up and see what's going on. But the main thing from the Catalyst point of view is that uh, the CAs have finished their job. Uh, if you've got proposals out, um, you would have received an email to say, go through and review those, uh, the CAs. So get in there. You've got till the 22nd, I think, uh, to actually uh, review them. Other than that, um, I've actually, the last couple of days, I've finally had a bit of quiet catch up time. <laughs> it's been very busy for me. Um, and just to reiterate the, uh, idea of uh, FEST coming through for the Eastern Town Hall. So if anyone's got proposals in there from the Eastern Town Hall point of view uh, that wants to run, uh, do a five minute presentation, that would be great. Right, um, to get the ball rolling, I'll just, um, uh, for those that don't know me uh, already, I'm Robert O'Brien, I'm a software engineer, mainly focused on sort of on distributed systems and financials side of things, um, but also been in the blockchain blockchain space for quite a while. Uh, so I can happily go very deep on technical stuff, um, but I'm conscious that uh, uh, a lot of people coming in here are at a, all sorts of different levels. So uh, it will be interesting to find out what people are, what motivates people, what interests you, what things you would like to learn or do. Um, and with that, I will randomly pick someone. And Peter, you are up next. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we gotta we gotta get a, a it's a double mute system I've got. All right, come on, you're a podcaster, so you should be able to you should be <laughs> comfortable with your, should, your <laughs> you, you think I should be a pro, but I'm I'm actually not. <laughs> um anyway, uh this is actually my first time uh town hall that I've actually managed to uh join because I only thought the Town halls ran at uh, 4 a.m. or uh, 3 a.m. for uh, our time zones. So it's uh, actually good to see an Eastern Hemisphere time, um, town hall appear and uh, be, be able to actually join it. Um, but we've got a catalyst proposal in the emerging threats uh, called Scam Alerts, and uh, we're building some tooling around there. So I'm working with a professor in New York to build that out. So he's already got that scam uh, process working quite well, and it's detecting a lot of um, scam sites and reporting them and taking them down with uh, Google. So that's that's a really good start and process, but we want to build that ecosystem out a little bit further so that um, dApps, wallet developers, uh, other third-party Cardano developers can actually tap into the API that we're building now and um, uh, be alerted, I guess of all the scams and uh, wallet addresses that are being used, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's where we're at at the moment. That's uh, what we're trying to propose and push through the ecosystem. And uh, it's getting pretty good feedback, but we, I haven't gone through the um, uh, Catalyst Advisors uh, stuff yet. So it'll be interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Sydney is. So where are you coming in from? Where, uh, where are you based? Gold Coast, Australia. That's right, yeah, uh, Australia somewhere. <laughs> okay, yeah. um, I should say I'm in uh, Tauranga, New Zealand, so uh, that's, uh, that's where I am at the moment. Um, Patrick, I was wondering if you want to give us a little intro. And... Hi, uh, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah, so I was, this is my second time in um, Catalyst meeting town hall meeting, and uh, well, basically I'm still learning everything about Catalyst and um, all those uh, community advisor and uh, propose um, uh, proposed projects and yeah, all that. So um, so I was here last time and Robert gave me a very good introduction on how everything is um, going forward and what the past 
um, what the what the community community has done in the past. So yeah, I'm still on the learning curve right now. So yeah, trying to catch up with everyone. Yeah, basically that's it. Good. Um, Matt, I was wondering if you want to give us a intro. Hey guys, um, I'm located in Thailand. Uh, I normally watch the town halls um, from the YouTube and I didn't realize there was an Eastern Hemisphere one either. So this is my first time. Um, I'm a community advisor, assessor, whatever they, whatever we're called. Um, no proposals, not that technical. Um, I guess my background is, is kind of accounting and that's what I'm interested in. So I just sort of follow along and see how I can, how I can be of assistance. Oh, Tiva, do you want to yeah. introduce yourself with your ice cream? <laughs> Hello, it's me, Tevo with ice cream. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, I've been uh, on the blockchain quite, also quite a while. So, um, when we talk about how, how many town hall has I visited, I think I have missed one live session since the starting of fund one. So I've been uh, quite a while. Um, what I do help to do is organize events, uh, including uh, the the start of the Eastern Hemisphere swarm session after down halls. And if you feel like you need a room somewhere, you can hit me up. Uh, and right now, mainly working on uh, mini proposal workshops uh, on the back line. So when Fund 7 starts and you are looking for to write the mini proposal, so you can uh, hit me up. I can help you with that. I have a um, uh, right now, it, it's in a state where we have a mirror board and with a lot of um, like uh, decision tree mapping and questioning. Uh, so it will be interesting thing to do. Tivo's, Tivo's middle name is Miro. Um, <laughs> uh, where, where are you coming in from, Tivo? Where are you, are you phoning in from? Uh, I'm from Estonia. Yeah. And uh, right, um, Ken. How are you today? Oh, I'm doing fine. Um, yeah, Ken Stanton. I've been been in Cardano for maybe three years, and uh, the, I've been with the company <laughs> since one two. Um, trying to to get proposals through, haven't got one through yet, but um, I'm sort of studying Plutus course semantics and distributed collaboration right now. So, and I'm here in um, Malawi in, in Southeast Africa. Cool. Uh, Benjamin, how about introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I've only just joined this community last week. So this is my second town hall. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm basically working in the tech industry for quite a number of years now, mostly on the commercial side of things. And um, this year in particular, I started sort of learning, actively learning more about blockchain in general. And um, I had to pick uh, a project, the community to get involved and um, Cardano was what I picked. So here is where I am. And um, I'm based in Singapore right now, but I've spent about six years in Australia as well because due to work, I've moved there for a couple of occasions and but now I'm back in Singapore. So yeah, nice to see everyone and um, hope to kind of discuss more about like Cardano in general and see how things are going uh, for the ecosystem in general. Troy, how about you up next? Yeah. Hi there, guys. Um, I'm from Australia, but uh, living in Bali. Um, uh, yeah, I've known about Cardano since 2017. Um, I've got quite a big purse of it. Um, uh, just doing it, just doing a few other different businesses. Just wondering how I could connect. Maybe there's something that I'm doing that I might be able to share to others, and might be able to connect somehow. And yeah, just, just, just checking it out. Cool. I might, I'll call on you later on to sort of see what sort of things you're interested in and getting in the conversation and stuff. So that'll be great. Uh, Naveed. Sure. 
Yeah, hi everyone. This is uh, Naveed Kazi. I'm from Canada. Currently, I'm based in uh, Seoul, Korea. So basically, I'm in uh, oil and gas, gas industry. I'm a control systems uh, professional. And I'm new, basically, to Cardano and the overall blockchain ecosystem. And I'm looking forward to learn a lot from the community. Thank you. Uh, we meet. Um, that's great to know. I um, might have to ask you a few questions. Um, Dimitri, it's good to see you here. Uh, are you coming up? Yeah, I'm uh, from Colombo in Sri Lanka. Uh, this is my first Eastern meeting, but I have been to two of the European meetings uh, in the last two weeks. Uh, I got involved with Cardano maybe about uh, a month ago. Um, just after the close of the Pan6, uh, actually, no, it was about two or three weeks ago, in, in the sense of with the Catalyst community. Uh, I've been involved with Cardano itself for about two months uh, as a, uh, as a mi not a miner, but mining and buying Cardano, uh, buying ADA. So um, my uh, area was, uh, so when I, uh, Pan6 closed was when I joined Catalyst, so I became a, a CA. So I've been spending the last week assessing and evaluating proposals. So uh, I'm very interested in submitting my own proposals for Fund 7. So this gave me a good idea to how proposals need to be done, the quality that is expected of proposals, uh, and so on. So I particularly joined the Eastern Town Hall because I was very keen in offering my services to do translation. There, there were multiple projects who needed translation done. So I run a translation agency with people all over the world who do uh, they are native speakers in those countries, so I work with them. So I could offer any particular language uh, translation services. So that's one of the other things, apart from my own proposals, that I plan on talking to uh, different proposers and seeing what they want. Yeah, so um, I, I think I sent you a message on ID Scale, but um, definitely keen to have more translation expertise and, and things in terms of what we're trying to do with the Eastern Town Hall to try and expand the languages that are available and just basically to try and get a lot of content translated irrespective of the language, although we're focused on just the Eastern Hemisphere sort of area at the moment. But the idea here is that we should be able to translate and get a lot of good practices going for basically languages all over the place. So uh, any expertise in that and helping sort of set that thing up would be great. Uh, Lester. Can you see me or hear me? We, we can indeed. Think. Yes, yes. Hello, hello from Sydney. Um, like most people here, I um, usually attend the European town hall, but given that it's like two o'clock or three o'clock in the morning here in Sydney, I never finish it. So I always usually just finish it on YouTube. Uh, this is my first Eastern Hemisphere town hall. Uh, last, I uh, first heard about it during the voting for the circle uh, a few weeks back. Uh, in terms of Catalyst itself, I've been a CA since Fund 3 uh, and a VCA since Fund 5. So, uh, you know, contributing in whatever, however way I can. Good to see everybody. Yeah, it's lovely to see you too. Uh, it's good. You know, we've got quite a few people from Australia here this time. Greg, who's my usual host, is uh, unavailable the last couple of weeks because he's been swamped with personal matters, but he's usually around here as well. So there's, he's coming in from uh, uh, from Melbourne, usually, on that sort of front. And for those that were here last week, when I was absolutely exhausted and shattered, um, I might be a little bit more animated today, uh, which will be good to see. Right. Um, so a uh, big bunch of people, which is great to see or anything. Um, I was just wondering how you wanted to uh, approach this sort of stuff. Do you want people to talk about their proposals for those that have got up? Uh, if there's any questions you anyone has, just put your hand up or, um, you know, a motion and we can just sort of kind of kick the uh, discussion going if there's anything um, really pressing that people are interested in. Uh, we we can go from there. Um, like uh, I can start the ball rolling in terms of like what uh, Dimitri was talking about um, and what we're doing with the Eastern Town Hall, which is all the translations. But Peter's got his hand up, so I'm going to throw it straight to you. 
Right. Um, thank you. Uh, in your intro, you mentioned a little thing about idea fest or pitch fest or whatever you might have called it. Um, is this in line with what uh, some organizers are doing and collating, you know, those five minute pitches and uh, submitting them around the world? Is, is that the same thing or is this something completely different or is uh, something tied in? No, it's completely different. That was um, the summit stuff was to basically have a, a catalyst stream within the summit, which is next week, obviously. So um, I no doubt everyone will be chiming into that a little bit. Uh, so proposers were invited to basically give a five minute pitch. Uh, what that does do, though, is it sets you up well for ideas, idea fest, because in a sense, if you've already done a pitch to the summit, then that uh, you can more or less use the same material for your idea fest if you want to um so that's no problem at all the the the, the just the idea behind idea fest uh the first one was run for fun five is that right tv the first one was done um yeah so the first one was done for fun five um and i don't i can't remember the numbers of people but the idea here 100 people 100 people. Right. So the idea is, as a proposer, you give a, a pitch for five minutes uh, around what your proposal is, and then you've got another five minutes to answer questions from people in the room. Uh, there's four proposers per room just to make it manageable. Uh, and so uh, essentially, people will join the room that is of interest to them, because they will be somewhat organized uh, around so some sort of criteria. I think Based on the numbers for the Eastern Town Hall, uh, we will have about three, maybe four rooms. Um, and uh, then the idea here is that every you give your five-minute presentation, and then there's five-minute questions from people in the room that you can have an opportunity to, to answer. Those sessions are recorded and will be edited and put up under the Idea First uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so people can go and look at them, review them, and see what the questions are. And really, it's about creating a bridge between proposers and voters, um, and indeed other proposers. So you know, in backwards and forwards, so people can learn about what's going on. Absolutely brilliant! That's fantastic. Now, didn't know about it. Now I do. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, we will for the Eastern Town Hall. We'll be putting up a a form next week for enabling people to um, sign up and register for the Eastern Town Hall one. There's also an idea fest, which is for the Western Hemisphere, uh, North America, that sort of thing, which is the main one. Um, I, I don't know, has this sort of been discussed? There's probably nothing to stop you from presenting in both, or is it intended that uh, you just do one? Do, have you got any thoughts on that, Tiva? Uh, actually, uh, yesterday, we, there was a discussion about it, but I was missing that time, so I'm not sure the details. Hmm. Um, so we'll definitely have a form for the Eastern Panel Idea Fest, but there's already one somewhere um, for the, maybe Tivo can throw that in the chat if he knows where it is, uh, to register for the main one as well. There's just a link to register on that side. Okay. Uh, Benjamin. Yes, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is kind of like a follow up to the earlier question regarding Idea Fest. Is it kind of like a hackathon format where teams can pitch and then people can decide and ask more questions about it? Or do we have something else that is more like a hackathon in the community that, that happens? Because I've not been around long right. enough. So, yeah. um, so Idea Fest isn't a hackathon type of situation, other than the similarity is that you're giving a short pitch. Um, uh, the difference here is that the short pitch is now five minutes rather than a minute, which is typical of a hackathon. And obviously you're not trying to form a team because you're really talking about your proposal that you've already got in fund six, nothing else, just, just that area. Are there any other um, hackers, hackathons or related sort of areas? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, Ada Maker Space has been doing a hackathon. Uh, for they've run it virtually for uh, a few weeks over a period of time. Uh, we do for the Eastern Town Hall, we have a proposal up for running a startup weekend type of thing, except because of COVID uncertainties and online sort of situations, we're going to span it out over a month. 
uh, and the intention here is basically uh, this is very much for not so much a hackathon, but more of a startup weekend. And there is a distinction between the two. Uh, but the idea here is that um, teams that form from uh, and come together, their objective is actually to develop uh, proposals that get submitted into Fund 8. Um, so that's um, to teach sort of entrepreneurship skills in relationship to uh, Kadano generally, Catalyst specifically. You know, what does it take to pitch, do a proposal? What does it mean to be an entrepreneur? Form a team. Uh, and we'll be running that virtually over a month period, uh, basically to try and replicate what happens in a sort of long weekend, 52 hours sort of format of startup weekend. Uh, um, because of the COVID situation and stuff like that, we've chosen to do it virtually. Okay. Um, and no doubt there's also other sort of hackathon events um, that have happened. Um, so there was a Wyoming one uh, last year, around October last year. I don't know if that's been repeated again. That yes. was more generally about um, blockchain, not specific to Cardano. Um, and so, so you're seeing them pop up more and more. There are actually the Wyoming uh, Stampede uh, Hackathon does have one challenge, at least one last year that that the challenge to propose uh, on idea scale. Um, and you were able, Cardano people were able to see the both challenges, like our own main uh, catalyst challenges and uh, Wyoming uh, hackathon challenges uh, together. So maybe they're more related because the organizer of that uh, hackathon is actually part of the NFTDA, which came up from the catalyst. Yeah. Uh, so Rich right. is. Rich's organizers organizes the uh, Wyoming hackathon um, for doing that. So yeah, plenty coming along. Uh, as I say, the Eastern Town Hall startup weekend sort of stuff is where we've decided to focus either on Indonesia or Vietnam to begin with. Um, uh, one or two of the areas. It's purely just logistics and just to get things going to, to understand how we're doing. But um, the intention would be then to run, like, for example, another one for Fund 9, another one for Fund 10 uh, in broader areas like, say, Singapore or um, some, um, Australia, Bali, Singapore, that sort of thing. It's really just down to logistics and finding the appropriate people and building up the capacity and skill set to be actually able to run these sort of things. Um, so, uh, but the, the, certainly the startup weekend stuff. What I'll stress about the Startup Weekend, which is distinct from the hackathon sort of stuff, the Startup Weekend approach um, is designed not necessarily to um, uh, have a commercial, you know, viable business or proposal at the end of it. What you're really doing is you're coming along, one, to meet other people that are interested in uh, trying to figure out how to uh, uh, use Cardano within market opportunities they might see, but largely saying, look, I have see this market opportunity, but I don't know how to handle it. I don't have teammates. I don't have, I don't know what it actually means to be an entrepreneur or trying to get a business off the ground. So it, it's more about learning by doing through experience um, rather than necessarily trying to say, hey, we get a viable business out the other end, right? Uh, that that's the intention of the sort of startup weekend side of things. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for sharing. And the other question I had was about Cardano Summit because uh, I've seen some emails coming out regarding like community-led events for the Cardano Summit. Is there a difference between the community-led ones and the kind of the main or the virtual one that's happening? Here? Right. So the community ones are basically. Um, Literally anyone could vol volunteer to be a host around the world. So you put in, hey, I'm going to be a host uh, for this city. So in Singapore or wherever you happen to be. Um, and uh, so those that have done that, there's basically these um, meetup places where you can come along um, and you know, meet people in person that are interested in the same space while you're watching and discussing the summit. Um, so uh, where are you again? Are you in Singapore? Yes, I'm based in Singapore. And I'm wondering why is there a 
Singapore based community for Karano, interestingly. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, there is usually there's a few people from Singapore in here, but they're not here today. Um, there's usually about two or three people. So you're, uh, you know, in terms of from Singapore. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if there was a community host for the Singapore area. I, I can't remember where they, uh, whether there was or not. I did encourage Dippin to try and put his hand up for that, I think, a few weeks ago, but whether he did or not, I don't know. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so that, that's what they are, really, is just um, an opportunity to meet people that are also, you know, interested in Cardano, in your place, um, and, you know, to go over all the sort of stuff that's happening with the summit. Um, if the summit is anything like last year, it was incredibly high quality content um, last year's stuff was. Um, I was still watching all the different streams and stuff several weeks after um, because of there was just so much in there uh, to go through. And in fact, I was re-watching one of them last week. Um, they're really yeah, pretty, we watching is good because they have quite a lot of valuable detail. And another thing, uh, actually from Summit, it was the first time I found out about Catalyst and or invited people from these discussions there into the new projects. So when they're launching about Prism or uh, whatnot, I have no clue because they are like keeping all in <laughs> surprising uh, tight there. <laughs> we'll see if there is some new projects or registrations coming up and you are interested in them, then you probably are going to be a pioneer in whatever they're going to launch there. Yeah, um, there'll be a lot of good stuff coming through um, on that front. Hey, Stephen, I've noticed you popped up in here. Do you want to introduce yourself um, since uh, you're coming in? It's lovely to see you. It's lovely to be here, lovely to be seen. Um, hang on one moment. I've got to change my microphone, I think. Yeah, that's a, probably a little better. Uh, yeah, I'm Steve Aldrich. Um, like TiVo, um, I uh, came into Catalyst um, there uh, at the summit, uh, or just immediately following the summit after Dora announced it last year, and uh, been around. Um, lately, I've been kind of taking a bit of a hiatus, I would say, uh, not nearly as much time spent in Catalyst as as, uh, as I did for the past year or so. Um, but I could not sleep today, and I thought, what the heck? I haven't been to an Eastern uh, Hemisphere Town Hall yet, so I'd come in and see see how things are going. Now, it's uh, lovely to see you. You're coming in from Miami, aren't you? Is that right? Well, I'm north of Miami. I'm, I'm at the very north. Uh, this, this is the area called the First Coast uh, of Florida. Um, oldest city and oldest continuously inhabited city in the United States, St. Augustine. Okay. So, yeah. Cool. So it, it seems like the, the time zone is actually really quite a good fit that we've found because people's coming, coming in from everywhere. Right. So um, just wondering, any other sort of questions or uh, burning issues that people have or anything else? So we've covered the uh, hackathons and the idea fest and anything else. Quite happy to discuss proposals as well, if people are up for that, uh, what proposals you've got in, um, and if you want to mention them. So Peter, you're talking about your threat stuff and um, scam detection and things like that. So happy to uh, talk about that more. There we go, mute button. Um, yeah, so just to give everyone a little bit of an overview of, of the project. So um, I'm, I'm working with uh, Professor Nick, Nick Farakis um, from uh, New York. I think he is in Long Island, but he's, he's developed the Cardano scam bots um, and it publishes uh, regular scams that it detects on Twitter at the moment. But, um, you know, not everyone uses Twitter. So we're just trying to build that out so that more people are aware of these uh, scams and whatnot. But um, the more important side of it is that um, the scam detection and then reporting to various um, agencies, whether it's uh, the domain name registrars or the hosting companies uh, or whatnot. So we're, we're going through and trying to find um, all those uh, different hosting companies, partners or whatnot to uh, try and take these websites down as quickly as we can find them. And uh, so that, that's working quite well at the moment. And a couple of the um, hosting providers that we've contacted, well, Nick has mainly contacted 
um, are taking down the scams that we find. So that's absolutely fantastic. Um, we're, we're trying to work out if we can um, work with Google and other high level um, you know, uh, people in the industry to actually uh, use some of our data so that we collect um, and uh, you know, protect users by, on the browser level as well. So I, I know when we um, submit some websites to um, IHK in, uh, in general, uh, we can get some of these sites taken down as well. So it's, um, uh, it's a multi-pronged approach. Um, and then from there, we're going to start looking at um, uh, OCR scanning uh, on YouTube. So as soon as these scams come up and we're constantly monitoring what's going on on YouTube so we can um, take down the scams off YouTube, uh, find the addresses, track addresses and track where money, money and ADA is going on all of these addresses as well, which would be um, uh, a little bit fun. Uh, but as soon as we discover which uh, addresses uh, the ADA is moving onto and uh, eventually hitting an exchange, for example, hopefully we can build any, uh, partnerships with some of these exchanges so we can stop the money from leaving the exchange as well and maybe recover some ADA for some people. I don't know. That, that's a, a pipe dream. Maybe we can get there. Um, but yeah, our, our proposal is just to start scaling up our solution at the moment because at the moment it's running off uh, Nick's laptop at home. So... <laughs> You know, uh, to, to be able to do this, we, we've got to scale it up. And uh, a, a lot of the API that we want to develop, uh, which we've partially gone through. So we've developed the API to um, allow other third-party developers to get our data, um, which, is, which is cool. Um, but um, the servers are going to cost a lot, I think. Um, so we're just a little bit worried about pricing that in and uh, trying to get it right so that um, when developers start hitting it and um, start integrating into wallets, like if you're in your ROI and you're thinking about participating in one of these scams, thinking you get double your ADA back, you get a little alert saying, no, this has been flagged as a scam. Are you sure you want to still send your ADA? And yes, you can still send it, but you know, at least you've been told. That's where we're at at the moment. <laughs> uh, fingers crossed that we um, do get some funding for this so we can scale it up and do some cool things with it. Um, and then uh, we're going to just build more awareness, educational tools around it as well. And um, uh, Nick also wants to do some machine learning and uh, uh, some smarts around it. So, yeah. Steve. Steven. Yeah, I had a, a quick question. Um, has anybody done any research to see uh, whether um, it going to those scams is coming out of uh, self-hosted wallets or from exchange addresses? Because it feels to me like it's the exchange address holder uh, that's probably the most vulnerable um, if you understand what I'm saying Peter yeah yeah we've um, we've we've done a little bit of tracking and it's a bit of a mix so it's it's um it it is completely a mix we, we even watch and monitor the ADA move around to private wallets and stake at various stake pools so you know it's it comes a question like are, are those stake pools also um part of the scam so like what why are they staking at that particular stake pool so it's um a little a little interesting with, with those kind of uh detective work that we're doing as well um so so you're you know, actually capturing all of those addresses as well is, is yeah we're we're, thing? we're watching where money is going beauty where ada is going specifically very awesome yeah yeah, and then uh, yeah, each each time, like we're using a stake stake ID of each one of the wallets as the unique identifier. So if it starts going to another address that we haven't picked up before, we add it to the list. Um, so you know the database is getting big. <laughs> um, so one last thing, and then I, and I'll shut up, and and Tivo can have the floor. Uh, I mean, do you have actually have a uh, a proposal in now, or you're thinking about yeah. building one? What is the name of the? Uh, yeah, it's the under emerging. It's under um, Cardano emerging threats. You want to throw the link in the chat, Peter? Yeah, yeah. throw throw the oh, link, yeah, will you, Peter? Yeah, yeah you're awesome. Awesome. Be great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, TV. There you go. Cool. Mute. <clears throat> you're on mute, TV. <laughs> <laughs> One was about uh, yeah, nice we get the link, but another I have you already done anything on YouTube um, APIs because I have uh, had experience that they kind of changed their logic quite a bit. Hopefully they have stopped now, but uh, 
recent years they've been messing it up and broke all my features which i haven't even fixed anymore uh, and it does get quite costly if you want to check every upcoming video and then check if they are if it automatically in one minute get like ten thousand views it's already you want to see that but requesting like every video to check and like requesting how many views he has how many subscribers it has what its name is everything costs like one or two this youtube points and uh, and if you get like ten thousand videos per minute or what the hell they like crazy amount is you're gonna pay like ten thousand euros per minute no uh it, yeah we're, we're trying to work away uh work our ways around it and um uh, doing front-end scraping um as well so we're, we're not hitting the api and using the api directly um so we're not paying for things so you know we're cheap we're running on home laptops at the moment so it's uh and and you know the the amount of um ada or um funds that we're requesting is uh, only 10k and that's just to scale up the first part of it um so you know what what nick's working on at the moment is working okay um and we're doing the detection mostly on the website level so if, if we can get it onto the youtube level um it sounds like it's going to cost us a lot more uh we will but you know it's a it's a balance and um, I will call on you to get some advice on that if, <laughs> if, if you've had to deal with that before. Yeah, I myself not a developer, but I have hired a developer to do features. So I, I might have some information to share. Cool. Thank you. Uh, do you want to, uh, Peter, can you talk a little bit about um, IOG's uh, threat response? Uh, I can't remember what they've referred to it as now. Um, that they yeah, announced it's one of those weird names. It, uh, it's, uh, uh, there's a couple of things that they got. So they've, they've got a, a team where um, you can submit, firstly, um, anything that you detect as a scam. So if, if you find a scam, something running on YouTube, or you find a website, you can submit it to the team and you know they'll action something. So we've, we've been posting stuff over there as well. Um, so it's added to the, the great growing list they have. Um, there's also a... Uh, Charles put out a video talking about um, a squad. I can't remember what, I really cannot remember what he called it, but uh, a Kadanu scam squad uh, that could help with policing this kind of thing. Um, and there were, um, he mentioned something on the lines of matching um, the dollar amount to try and uh, uh, stop these scams. Will it be enough? I don't know. Um, but you know, it's uh, we, we haven't gone down that path of like you know forming a larger team to try and um, uh, stop the scams and uh, take it on from different approaches uh, legally as well, uh, because you know you, you can um, force YouTube, for example, uh, legally to take these and stop these uh, scams and and put more effort into it. Uh, but you know, recently we've we have found that um, YouTube is doing a little bit more active um, scam work and trying to take down these videos as well. Uh, but it's interesting on how they are getting around it. Like um, we've we've seen uh, quite a few. Uh, I've, I myself personally have seen quite a few videos um, and methods that these YouTubers are doing. Uh, these hackers are doing to YouTube videos to get around the algorithm uh, for the, the their scam detection and uh, copyright protection as well. So it's a uh, it's interesting methods. What do you think of it being sort of basically whack a mole? Yeah, exactly. But you know, if if we can make the life of these um, scammers as difficult as possible, and the cost of actually uh, making these scams and spinning up the websites and spinning up addresses more and more costly for them, uh, great. You know, that's that's a, a deterrent. You know, go go hack Ethereum, for example. You know, it's it's worth more. You're introduce, you basically want to introduce a little bit of cost into it. Um, so one of the the actually the origin of um, Bitcoin's uh, proof of work, for example, came from something called Hashcash, which was actually designed by uh, Adam Back to introduce a cost to email uh, sending. That's what it was originally designed for, um, to try and tackle the uh, email spam problem before the Bayesian filters were started to get applied and adopted. Uh, but Dimitri's asked the question as an example of an ADA, uh, uh, in the chat there, of uh, an example of an ADA scam. I just wonder if you wanted to fill that in. Oh, just go to YouTube and, <laughs> I don't know. 
there's uh, let, let me just find one like, yeah yeah it, so they're, there's, they're essentially like these giveaways so you 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 go onto youtube but you're, you're searching your favorite youtuber um, and then suddenly you see on the side this uh really great graphic that says ada giveaway live charles hossenson predicts ada at 25 dollars within a year and you go most people click on it they go yes i do want to create that money uh generate more money so they'll click on it they'll watch a um a, a a video that has been edited of Charles and it's just embedded in the corner. And the rest of the video would have like details of an address, a website maybe, and um, basically something saying like, if you um, post uh, or, or send a thousand ADA to this address, we'll send you twice as much back. And then if you send 10,000, we'll give you 20,000 back. So this, this really um, clinches people's emotions that are, you know, one, financially stressed as it is, have put an investment into ADA, wanting to get something back to get them out of their situations, whatever it is. So it's it's not your average person that's, you know, just investing on the side. It's people that are emotionally attached and have emotional um, attachments to their investment and, and wanting to get something more out of it. So it's capturing these people and it's really unfortunate. Um, and the hackers know this because they're, they're using the emotional part of the trigger to create that urgency, to create that um, uh, need to get more ADA um, and using that to scam them out of their ADA. And, you know, this has evolved from the general scam calls where they'll call you up and say, hey, um, there's something wrong with the computer. Can you give us access to it? So it's just an evolution from there because those, those types of scams um, require a lot more effort, a lot more time, effort, someone on the phone calling them through. These ones, you just hack someone's YouTube account, uh, someone with a big following, and then just um, mm. put up one of these videos and then, hey, presto, you, you, you get um, people sending you ADA that, um, you know, is, is worth quite a lot and um, can't reverse Unlike yeah. a, you know a bank transfer or a credit card fraud, you can reverse it. There's there's insurance and policies behind it, but not with ADA, yeah. Yeah. not in the blockchain. That's right, uh, Stephen. Yeah, so a couple times a week, I will. Uh, I'm on YouTube a lot, and uh, and I'll just uh, stop and I will search, you know, Cardano, Ada, Hoskinson, and then I will filter that search to only live videos, and then I play whack a mole for about an hour. Where, and I just have a script that I, that I type in, you know, it starts off all caps. We will never give away ADA. And then it varies depending on how pissed at YouTube I am, uh, what I say after that. But, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I do this a couple times a week. I'll, I'll spend an hour just playing whack-a-mole. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's how I do it. I just filter by live. Yeah, and it's not just uh, Cardano, it's it's all blockchain. So you see Vitalik there, you see, um, you know, XRP, you, you see all of them, they're like giving away, you know, free cryptocurrencies then. 100%. Yep. Tiba. Yeah. I had an interesting experience when I first time found out about the scam. I was looking, uh, I think Bill Gates was talking about... Uh, not tokenomics, but kind of related thing. And then they had a frame on it, it's like weird, weird. And it only said that 1,000 data giveaway. And back then it was like 20 or 30 cents. So I was like, okay, maybe, maybe it's just having fun or something. Uh, but when I looked at the website, because I was curious, like, what the hell is this? There was like 10,000 views. That's like everything looked so legit. I went to the website and the website just had a counter and and then and, and just uh, withdraw like a sending amount of the QR code. And I was like, okay, that's that's fishy. Like there's no no more information. Looked at the, the the behind the scenes when you like you can inspect element Q and then you see the code behind it. And then I saw it the uh, code said that it loops through the time and goes uh, incremental and then st starts back on and always starts when you refresh the page. So it refreshed the page and the, the time started again. So uh, so that's why I realized, okay, this is something weird. And then I started looking into, okay, okay, I cannot comment in the chat and then look at around and started finding more of these kinds of scams. That was like six or seven, or like actually this was last year because, yeah, because the price was quite low. And I mean, even if you're sophisticated, but you're a bit drunk or a little, and then you look at, oh, few hundred euros, like, sure, I can send it away. Uh, but 
it can be annoying to get captured by this. Um, I was, uh, uh, Troy's got a question in here around, um, has anyone actually heard of experienced ADA hacked from Daedalus or Euro wallets? I haven't uh, myself. I don't know if others have, have, has, have you come across? Yeah, well, we've seen a, a Daedalus scam when um, uh, each time there's a new release that comes out. So um, there'll be uh, bots that spam out messages saying, uh, please update your Daedalus and it will take you to daedaluswallet.com or something very similar. It looks very official because it's using the same language of the update that you may get. So people will click on that and go, oh, okay, well, I better update it. It's uh, rather important. It's my investment. It's their uh, speculation. They'll go in there and the first sc screen that they'll see is entering your seed phrase. And this is to an unknown wallet. So it looks all legit and they will enter in their seed phrase and that's it, it's gone. Uh, the hackers will see that come in, they'll empty their wallets and everything disappears. And uh, the person's left holding an empty bag and not understanding what just happened because all they did was just update Daedalus. Yeah, that's, uh, there's a lot to it. Uh, Pat, uh, Benjamin, yeah. So you've asked some questions here around with uh, did base solutions or, uh, more specifically, it's re verifiable reputation. Would that sort of uh, help? Um, yes uh, and no uh, is the, the good question. Is that um, yes, it will help for those people that are aware of it. And so if you consider, for example, um, the problems around uh, certificates of for HTTPS was one of the first attempts to try and um, there was a whole lot of scams around that and just trying to educate the whole market about the green badge tick and the consistency of that took years, absolute years. And even the certificate uh, transparency stuff was really problematic. You know, you're theoretically supposed to trust these CAs. Uh, these are certificate authorities, not the community advisors, uh, CAs. But they were getting hacked, uh, cracked and, and broken into and certificates were being issued, so you couldn't really trust them. Took a long, long time for that to start getting on top of it, um, and you know, getting people to switch over to use HTTPS and that sort of thing. So the answer is yes, it does. But there's also a huge educational component that people have got to be aware of how that reputation signal is surfaced into the user interface, and uh, learn about and learn to use and understand it. Um, so technically, we can go off and stamp things, you know, verify stuff. But even just the Daedalus site, the fact that, you know, people you know, can be tricked by the domain name easily. Um, they don't know what cues to look for, what things to look for. Um, and so uh, they easily get, you know, taken into account. I, I'm on just on a more general area around all this, uh, you know, internet security. I'm um, first port of call for my parents. You know, uh, I've been educating them for about 15, 20 years around what to look for and what to watch out for uh, on different things. But you know, my father in particular still gets taken in by these sort of stuff um, because to him it looks legitimate, the signals. And I, I know, Stephen, you're, you're dealing with some of the sort of old, older citizens and stuff like that that aren't technically savvy and they are, they are easy target easy pickings yeah it's it's really really disturbing uh to me you know i've got you know an awful lot of clientele here and they're just they're lovely folks and they'll call me up ashamed just absolutely ashamed they don't want to admit what they what they allowed themselves to get into my concern i just wrote an article for local newspapers my concern is that they don't tell anybody they don't tell their friends they don't tell their uh family uh, sometimes they don't even tell their financial institutions and they don't know what to do to protect themselves afterward. Uh, so anyway, yeah. So definitely there's um, the whole value chain of this to solve this particular problem is massive. Um, lots of different pieces. So does um, doing things like uh, did some and developing a decent reputation system help yes um and we can go a long way towards doing that um but it's certainly not the only response you know you have to tell people what to look for in terms of the signals 
but even then, you know, you just, in many respects, you're somewhat moving the target a little bit um, because, uh, you know, they'll adapt, they'll find other ways, they'll just be becoming another sort of thing. What I was particularly, I'll, I'll get to you, Troy, in a moment, but I'm particularly interested here. One of the things you were talking about, Peter, is that you're collecting all this data up, but one of the things, and I'm going to ask you a question, just warning you here, Navid, I'm going to ask you a question about something, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, is that this is happening in a network, all right? So we've got um, these relationships between like domain names, YouTube accounts, and they just pop up another account and another one going on. So there's networks forming. And one of the interesting things is, can you apply a lens these like network science is being applied to it? And I know you can, but um, the question here, what I'm more interested in is, um, you're a, a systems control engineer. Have you, uh, Navi, have you ever considered like looking at it from that point? Um, I know you probably haven't, but how, what sort of things could you apply from systems control theory um, that could look at network flows of scammers to help identify them? I wonder if you'd ever given that sort of a thought. Uh, basically, I'm a control systems engineer on the uh, industrial side of it. Like you're talking of uh, plant-based oil and gas uh, control mm -hmm. systems. Basically, we're talking of distributed control systems and programmable logic controllers and things like that. So I'm not much more, I mean, much into the software part of it, basically. Yeah, but um, the science, the, the, the discipline that you've been talking about, process engineering, chemical processing engineering, if you were right. to take that understanding and apply it to network flows for scammers, I think you'd probably find some interesting uh, uh, Yes, ideas. probably, yes. True, yeah. true we can uh, definitely you know, do uh, a bit of research on it and see I mean, how best we can um, you know, try to implement something which should be able to help us uh, you know, do yeah. something in this particular field. Yeah, that's a good point. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so I, th I think it's very possible because a lot of the a lot of the um, uh, education that uh, systems systems engineers and process chemical processing a lot of that sort of domain is actually can be applied to trying to understand what's actually happening in forms of interactions of uh, network based systems uh, if you look at them from a process point of view process lens I think it's fruitful area to actually target that sort of notion. Network science, um, you've got traffic flow of these addresses going, because ultimately the, the reason for them doing something is to try and get your ADA. And that means that they're coming from uh, known addresses, or well, they've got to have an address, right? Uh, that they want the ADA to go to. That's the first thing. And that's a form of interaction from one ADA address to another as an interaction. And they'll start to have some pretty good patterns that you can start to look at um, and assess. So it'd be really interesting to sort of see cross-discipline sort of thinking about the problem domain. Um, uh, Troy, yeah. Yeah, um, <clears throat> no, just getting back to what Peter was saying earlier, um, how uh, someone could possibly hack our Daedalus wallet uh, by giving them a false website uh, for a new update. And um, I think he said, uh, uh, what they'll ask you to put your your seed or uh, et cetera. I was thinking um, also because you can link Ledger, Nano S or these uh, other uh, hardware wallets uh, to properly secure. So maybe if that's something that becomes more um, uh, like standard, I mean, I, I've got a, the funny thing is I've got a Ledger Nano S, but because it's a bit fiddly, so I don't even use it. I just keep my ADA in my Yoroi or Daedalus wallet and uh, just to easily be able to trade it, um, I just rely on that. Um, but like, yeah, maybe um, together with uh, the Ledger, uh, the hardware wallet, maybe there's also something, I mean, because I don't think people can hack that, right? If anyone's been hacked sort of through a ledger, and and your the question is, has anyone heard of your mobile wallet being hacked? Uh, I don't know about the Euro one. Um, yeah, I no. will say that the um, no uh, a comment about whether the ledger is secure or not. Um, mm. No, no system is secure. Just assume that no anyone can crack 
um, something is given enough incentives to do things. Uh, the benefit of the hardware wallets like Ledger or Trezos or the others um, is that it makes it a little harder. The cost of doing that is a little bit harder because often you actually have to have access to the physical device in the first case. But literally it yeah. was a situation whereby um, uh, what there were Ledger um, hardware wallets being sold on Amazon that had basically mm. been purchased from Ledger, yep. tweaked, you know, uh, you know, enough to just even like the random seeds and stuff like that is enough to work, yep. be able to give the um, attacker an advantage. And then they were on selling them. And often the case is that they would sell them slightly cheaper for obvious reasons, because someone that's gone further and far enough in terms of holding things in a hardware wallet knows possibly what they're doing and probably owns a bit more than, you know, 500 bucks or something else like that. Um, so there was benefit in doing that. Um, the third aspect, which you you really highlighted by saying the fact that you don't, you find it too fiddly, the user experience of these things is even worse. And this is always a really big problem with security, right, is that even some uh, what should be good practice today of um, uh, password management. The reality is the easiest way to attack someone is through social engineering, not hardware, not software changes or anything else like that, but rather to actually figure out and social engineer them. So the attack that Peter was talking about with respect to um, you know, getting someone to install Daedalus and then doing a seed phase is basically a social engineering attack because it's recognizing that people don't actually know the difference between one domain name or another. They don't know what social cues to look for. Um, but even then, you know, if I really had identified someone, I could target them just by phoning them up and convince them to give me the seed phrase. Because a lot of people do not know the importance of the seed phrases, uh, even if they've got it. You know, they just don't know. Um, so usability in the security side of things is incredibly important. And at the moment, basically within the cryptocurrency space, generally usability sucks big time for the actual um, level of concern. Because like, for example, what the hell is an address? You know? um, even there's a bit of concern like around these ideas like um, uh, simplifying addresses right down to some known sort of value is, can be pro is a yet another attack vector. Um, for for doing things. It could secure things more, but it's also equally likely to be a, an attack vector as well um, because of the usability aspect. Um, the closest one really from a hardware wallet point of view that is possibly the most usable at this point in time is something like the Tangent card, okay? Um, that is mainly they're focused on the usability and what they're effectively saying within the tangent cards are that uh, you, you, you get one of these cards, there's already a, a, a public a private key on that card, you don't get to generate one, you don't get to upload one, um, it's physical security on that. Yes, you have to rely upon the, the security of their supply chain. But beyond that, it's pretty hard to work um, to attack. It uses an NFC interface, which means that people with contactless, um, uh, using contactless cards for payment are already actually somewhat comfortable with the process. Um, so that's the closest thing of combination of hardware versus and usability to increase security that's going on. But ultimately, um, if someone's going to be fooled to hand over something because of a scam attack, um, hey, you know, fear of missing out, hey, nice big up, I can earn a whole lot of money, doesn't matter where their keys are, all right? They're, they're motivated, they're going to do it anyway. They've been tricked into doing it, they'll go through uh, and send the money, right? Um, so that that's a, a big aspect of, of it. Um, so that, that's a little... Uh, little bit around all of that. Uh, Stephen. I just want to say that, you know, there is a big difference between socially engineering someone to download a non-official wallet and literally hacking a wallet that they have. So this is, this is a fine distinction here between hacking something that you have 
and getting you to download something that you didn't have before and give it all of your money. So, uh, so when, you know, I, I've heard a few people here this evening kind of, or this morning or whatever time it is, say something about Daedalus being hacked. Uh, we need to be really, really laser focused on what we mean when we say that. I think. I don't want anybody leaving this this specific meeting thinking, oh yeah, you know, Robert and, and Peter said that, or Stephen said, that Daedalus has been hacked before. That's, I don't, I'm not aware of anyone's ADA being stolen out of a, a, an official Daedalus wallet on their computer. Are, are any of you? And okay. yeah, you're so making for, a fine. Me, I'm just trying to trying to nail this yeah. down. This is not. We're not saying that. No, no. Um, so the the download Daedalus, you know, at a domain name that people don't know, that's actually more of a social engineering attack. And I I prefer the word crack or attack rather than hack because hack has a different meaning to me. Um, and uh, so cracking a bit of software is quite uh, important here, and doing an attack or doing a scam, they're all quite distinct things, okay? Um, so the, most of the scams and um, different forms of social engineering attacks um, are targeting the human, they're targeting this, not, not the hardware, not the software. And, um, you know, so it's the old adages that, uh, you know, uh, unsophisticated bank robbers uh, rob a bank sophisticated bank robbers become a manager bank, that sort of thing. <laughs> that's that sort of distinction. <laughs> yeah, Matt. Uh, and just, I don't know, we, we maybe we've labored this a bit, but one other uh, socially engineered attack vector that springs to mind is when blockchains have uh, help forums and they send people to telegram sites, and then they have official Telegram sites or maybe Discord, but then there's bad actors on there that have created IDs that look like, you know, Door or, or someone like that. They use their photograph, they use their name, and then they'll someone will ask a question, it doesn't get answered, and then then they'll get a, a tap saying, "I'm Door, I'll give you a private chat and I'll help you out with your advice," and that's when they can easily get sent to those website that say, well, just download the data. Let's see, this is the new one. Uh, you know, the programmers are working on it. We, it, it, unfortunately, it's not updating through the proper channels yet, but this will sort you out. And that can be extremely convincing too. And it's, it's the information channels that people use to get advice. Uh, absolutely. Uh, that's why I say the, the, the vector of attack for all of this is massive. Um, there's so many different avenues and uh, we haven't even seen much in or at all inside of catalysts yet but they're coming yeah the scam proposals those sort of things they're going to come uh, with absolute certain for those you know that at the moment it's it's largely been free of that as far as I'm aware but boy uh, as as awareness of the catalyst fund process and things like that becomes more available you're going to see a lot more of that um, and fake site, we're already seeing quite a lot of, a few, not quite a lot, I've seen a few sort of very dubious sort of uh, project sites popping up. Um, they're going to do this, do that or another thing. And there'll be things where they just copy websites and pop them up uh, to do token drops. And there's a general sense, I've got a general sense that um, from what I've been watching is um, that uh, there'll be another sort of, ICO type craze coming down the pipeline or it is starting to come down the pipeline. And so we'll see lots of lots of different uh, sites that are ripped, pro proposed, send us your money for the token drop, you know, the, this, that, and another thing with the latest DeFi protocol. Well, we got slushy swap at the moment, land swap. <laughs> so we're carrying on with the food, food meme uh, that's going on. Um, so it's going to become a lot, lot hard, harder to uh, figure who's who's legit and who isn't in terms of um, things like that. Because hey, greed, if you can get the fear of missing out, a lot of people dive in. Tivo. 
Yeah, just to continue, like I do see also I have way more proposals with way more of uh, like uh, working products already because they just forked the already existing uh, GitHub and they already got the minimum viable product. Because what we here usually do is open source material, and, and the more we do, the more material everybody else has to, to attack us. So we hopefully we are able to, to train and uh, just learn, educate ourselves to mitigate through this as a community advisor and as a general Cardano member. And um, what you just said, Matt, was actually uh, I didn't know that this thing also existed, but I was in a Polka dot Discord channel. And I was asking something about um, how to convert uh, KSM tokens, like there is like a testnet and not not test, like dot token, but they both are quite valued. So I was asking about uh, how do I vote on a uh, crowd loan, and I didn't get answer in like I think for like one hour, maybe less, but basically uh, I didn't get answer. And one somebody from the private list messaged me. And who had the uh, same like server and he said like i'm moderator and then i looked up his name and he was a moderator like literally there and then he asked okay there, here is a wallet you can download here is what you can do there is like gave all of the information and felt like it was actual human behind it because when i said something he responded back uh, but yeah in in the end it was like that he was a scammer who suggested the actually original uh, wallet, what actually exists, but uh, they still banned him because like, it was uh, fishy because nobody should uh, do it in private. <laughs> and it, he was taking somebody else's name. So yeah, yeah. weird stuff happening. All, all sorts kind of going on. Um, I've noticed within, there's been a few things around just the NFT stuff in the Ethereum space where there's a lot of insider trading going on, you know, yeah, pump and dumps to the moon, here we go again, uh, just with a different type of thing uh, going on. And, you know, picking it up is, uh, uh, yeah, it's, I don't know, it's just going to happen for quite a while, unfortunately. Um, so the best we can do is sort of try and support the sort of things that Peter's doing, um, proposing, and uh, like you're saying, Tivo, educate through the CAs, educate through Catalyst School. Uh, there's probably uh, quite a good reason to sort of like even bring people on board, uh, run sort of sessions specifically around how to identify scams. You know, if, if one of the easiest, the primary attack vectors is through the human sort of scale side of things, but can you do kind of like what you're doing with Catalyst School in terms of teaching people to go through the Catalyst process, but um, you know, teach them about scams? Because one of the key things that popped up, Uta have done, um, <laughs> this is interesting actually, there's two Utas in the session today. Uh, uh, so someone's signed up as Uta Uta. Uh, so <laughs> and Uta was going, hmm, that's not me, as we were talking to him in the green room. <laughs> um, but uh, he did a survey with the Japanese community and a big reason why they weren't voting is because they didn't understand this idea of um, voting, uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, you know, is it a scam, am I going to lose my ADA because I've got to vote, you know, this just this understanding of the distinction between voting and the ADA sort of thing needs to be uh, brought through. So yeah, I can't help but think, you know, part of the response to, you know, the emerging threats and stuff like that is actually through uh, education and stuff. Because as TiVo pointed out, a lot of our material is going to be open source, is going to be easily copied. It's, you, you've seen it over the last few years, especially as we went into the uh, 2017 sort of real hype cycle of the ICOs, there was lots of effectively copied plagiarized documents spun up people threw money in, hey, ran away. And I think we're going to be seeing a lot of that, not just in Cardano, but across the board um, as the prices go up. Yeah. So I'm, I haven't been tracking the uh, chat too much. Is there any sort of questions going, anything that uh, you want answered at all? Dimitri, so you down, what, what was your experience with the Daedalus? What? You, you were downloading it and you couldn't understand 
what was going on? Yeah, I could. Yeah, it, it, there were multiple things of verifying a signature and verifying something else, and telling me to do something with uh, Cleopatra, and I got confused. What needs to happen first? Uh, because if I did something out of order, then I could compromise the, uh, you know, whatever was being set up. So I just stopped it until I could get a better handle of the whole thing. Uh, in the meanwhile, for purposes of the uh, uh, fun six, I downloaded URI and I installed that. So that was not complicated. So uh, that's where I am at the moment. But once I can understand what the Dallas process is, what do I do first? One, two, three. Uh, then I would restart that whole thing. Hmm. So, so Daedalus being a uh, full node wallet takes quite a while to sync up. And I think if you're new to the whole space, that's actually um, quite difficult to understand the, what's actually going on. So wallets like Uroy are better, than that, uh, are better for that situation to get people comfortable and feeling because they're not full nodes. Um, they're just an in-browser one. Steve, you want to, uh, you've yeah. On? So, so uh, Dimitri, the the time frame where you got confused was it uh, trying to verify the um, with the checksum, or was it when you actually had the wallet installed? You had Daedalus installed, and then you were trying to create a new wallet. Where was the where was the concern rising for you? Uh, I ran the executable file, I installed the thing, then it was telling me uh, uh, various things like verify the signature and I didn't know what to do first because there was no, uh, it, it was just on the page, both the verify checksum and verify signature were both there, if I remember right, um, it was a couple of weeks that so I may be getting the terminology wrong, but there were two things that needed to be verified, I wasn't sure whether I should do that before installation or after. Uh, anyway, some, somewhere along the way, uh, it was asking me for something called the Cleopatra token or something beginning with a K, if I remember. And uh, that point, I just gave it up. Okay. Uh, did, did you have a tutorial something? Because <laughs> I, I, I have been quite that bad at secret, I guess, because I didn't do the checksum. I just downloaded it. The original data was and that was it so far still have the money yeah. uh no i wasn't following a tutorial but i saw that so, these were there so i thought at some point i've got to do it uh, um so i'm not sure whether i had to do it before or after installation okay. but they, what what really uh what really made me give up was this cleopatra token because it was asking for all sorts of things like uh, getting up key and um, sending it to a email and then uploading it to a directory server and this directory server thing wasn't working so i thought you know to help with it i'll use something else uh sounds like very dubious uh basically that's not deadless at all uh essentially all you would need to do is go to the website you should get the the the, uh, the checksum or the gpg key and you verify it the file that you've downloaded before you install it, always do that sort of stuff before, right? Before you even click anything. And um, it should not ask you for anything other than if it's the first time to create a wallet, it will create the wallet for you and generate your seed phrase for you. Uh, if this Cleopatra thing sounds very, uh, very dubious, uh, asking for keys or anything else like that, no, uh, that is basically, uh, what we were talking about earlier in terms of what was going on. So um, you were wise not to not to carry on with the process. Uh, and in fact, I would make sure that um, your machine is actually, if you've got any virus checkers or anything else like that, you give it a really, really good sweep. Um, and also um, make sure everything's um, uh, you know, removed appropriately, um, depending on what you're on, because that's, uh, you know, that was not, not a good sign at all. Um, but as a rule of thumb, uh, checksums, uh, sorry, um, signatures of files, of binary files, always check them before you click on anything. I realize that uh, to do so is a bit of a ask, it's a bit of a step. Um, the preferable approach is to check it with GPG, 
but that's even going further for most people that aren't familiar with them. The benefit of using Daedalus is because it's full node, takes a while to um, sync up with the network, can take a little while, um, but it's within your domain, it's within your control. So, um, but equally, that opens up the door to, um, you know, if uh, it being manned in the middle, so pulling that software down could be changed, even if you're, uh, even if you're going to the proper domain name, there's still opportunities for it to be adjusted. I haven't heard of anything about this before, but it's possible. And that's why you check or verify the, the um, signatures uh, of, of the hash of the files and stuff before you install them, because there's always many different steps in the process where you can be man in the middle uh, and it becomes interesting. I stress that this is not happening in Daedalus at the moment, but it's a very good practice to get into. Once you've got Daedalus up and running though, we've got the internal updates working. So you should never have to install Daedalus again at all yeah? um, because of the uh, internal update processes that are in there. Um, and that will verify all the signatures. It's going to the right place um, most of the time. Uh, I, you know, again, it's possible to attack DNS. It's possible to do things where you think you're going off to a particular domain name and uh, you're not even though it looks like you're going to the domain name. So that's where the signature files become really, really important to checking them. And when you're doing the update, uh, in process update of Daedalus, that's doing all that behind the scenes. Okay, Tifa. Um, just one more suggestion. If you're not sure how to do check jam, and even if you look guides and still don't get it, what also helps is download it, wait for a um, week, or two, if you have time for that, and check just uh, some kind of IOG, or pr probably Charles or somebody will tell you if their site was compromised, because they will see the traffic if the site was switched up with something else. Very hmm. cool down on it. Yeah, what I would um, generally recommend is if you're not familiar with a lot of stuff like that, it's going to use something like you or uh, to begin with and get really comfortable with that. Get comfortable with all the things like uh, what tokens are the language being used, those sort of things. Because with the uh, URI extension, that's using the security domain of um, uh, Google. You know, they've gone through verified things and make sure it's all legitimate. There's still opportunities for attacks of different kinds, but generally Google's onto it. Um, in which case, um, yeah, that gets you used to using things. And when you're more comfortable with doing things and understanding all the language that's being used and what to expect, then go and use something like a full node like Daedalus and go from that, that side of thing. Uh, Stephen. Yeah, it's amazing to me, and, and it shouldn't be, but it's amazing to me the number of people who don't understand uh, that the wallet, whether it be Roy, Daedalus, you know, Ada Light, whatever, that these are just basically viewers of the blockchain they're like an extended explorer they have the extended capability that you can spend and you can add you know you can uh, transfer utilizing them but you, you could have Uroi, Adalite, Daedalus you could have you could have all of these viewing your wallet whether you're on your mobile or you're on your desktop you want a full node you want a light client you know there it's it doesn't matter which which you use. You still have the same view of your your wallet, your holdings on chain. One of these, Peter. <laughs> there you go. A oh, Yubi key. A Yubi key, if I can find it there. Yeah. Uh, there we <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry, Stephen. He was uh, mucking around. Carry on. No, no, no. That was that's perfect. That's perfect. Yeah. Um, the, uh, for those that aren't familiar with YubiKeys, um, these are, um, they're for single sign-on, uh, or for second factor authentication more than anything else like that. Um, but you can also use it setting up with a whole lot of stuff. So I have all my GPG keys on this for my signing of my Git commits and that sort of stuff. I've got multiple because I use different accounts for different purposes. Um, and all I have to do is just touch the little par and it will sign things 
uh, most cases, but setting them up in terms of using them anything other than for the two-factor authentication, um, uh, which is the uh, typically what they use for, is really a pain in the ass. If you're doing anything more than um, so anything other than the basic use case for it, which is to help as a second factor for signing in, you, um, they're a real pain to set up. But that's true of um, most security things. This is always the trade-off with security is that um, you're giving up on user experience and can give configuration. And that ties back into Troy's earlier point is these things are finicky to use. So you can't expect your average user, your average person on the street to understand what they're doing. That is why the equivalent um, sort of thing is more familiar with people, which are these sort of things, the, this sort of form fit. I don't know if I can bring my card in. Uh, yeah, these contact lists like tangent cards. Yeah, I can't do it. You know, you know something or other. Um, uh, they've got exactly the same chip in them as the YubiKey. They can be used for the same purposes, but this is a the credit card ID1 format is more uh, understandable for a lot of people. Um, but they don't work with PCs and laptops particularly well at the moment. <coughs> Yeah, you, you are fail you, Peter, yeah. So yeah, not, nice to see you, Peter, and uh, all the best with your proposal and all that. Um, how was it? Troy, you said you wanted to sort of discuss some, some points um, uh, or things that were interesting you. Um, yeah, okay, I don't mind. Um, Oh, I just thought I'd uh, um, share a little bit. I've been um, deal messing around with uh, some. It's it's actually a robot, a crypto robot, and um, uh, it's been interesting. I've been using it for about one and a half months. Uh, this thing is 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 uh, making me uh, USDT uh, every day. Um, and I just, I just, I, I'm not sure. I, I, what I've realized is, with my Ada purse, it's, it's uh, by default staking is actually dollar cost averaging, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, right? So, the, you know, um, uh, that's how I see Ada. Ada is something that we stake. It's uh, by default becomes dollar cost averaging, you know, and and uh, so you're holding, you're staking, and your dollar cost averaging in, in one shot. And so on the side, I've been doing this uh, little robot crypto thing, and that is creating USDT every day, uh, as opposed to ADA, where it's like 6% a year, and they pay you every five days in Epoch. This one's giving me like a 1% return a day, which turns out to be 30%, around about 30% a month. And I was just wondering, um, is, is there possibly a way to... Uh, how, how how could I combine this? Because I'm doing this actively right now um, with a lot of people. I'm just thinking, is there a way to combine these? And and like, how would I go toward? How, I mean, they're they're both creating wealth. They're digitized money. And like, yeah, what what's happening? So the thing is, I sold some of my ADA to do the the this robot thing. And so while well, ADA's going up, and I'm just juggling, but these two things are creating uh, wealth. And I just don't, I don't know how how I could combine it. Is there a way to combine it? Is, is it something that's interesting to others? And um, yeah, that's about it. I just thought I'd share that out there. Um, so yep. uh, you would need to um, so the bot you're using is tra effectively trading USDT versus uh, it's trading, trading USDT pairs. Yeah, so it's got seventy choices of coins. And it's trading uh, USDT pairs, so uh, ADUT, USDT, Bitcoin, Ethereum, like, yeah, AVE, a, a whole, whole heap of coins. And what it's doing is it's um, taking one percent. Uh, it's get, taking one percent every trade, about one percent every trade. So if you put a ca running capital, say of a thousand dollars, it will be doing me, you know. Oh, yeah, I, I, I get the yeah. trading stuff like that. So yeah. uh, and so your combination here is you're wanting to combine it with the delegation of the component. Is that I no, no, no. I'm thinking I'm thinking how to uh to how is is this something that can be 
connected with the community and like i mean people making usdt can buy more ada and uh, i mean they're both forms of uh of generating wealth right um i just don't know how it, how if if it's if it can be linked uh, oh have you lost them i've lost troy we've lost her right okay <laughs> he's disappeared on me his trading bots taken over <laughs> uh, I, I, it's like completely off the topic right but i have electric bikes here in bali which um i've got 60 units i uh, work together with hotels and these are fat wheel bikes so they ride along the beach so that's there's something maybe linking with uh uh um was it energy saving and uh you know uh, uh, electric uh I, I don't know how to link it either right I, but i'm sure there's something that i could possibly link that with like uh carbon was it carbon cutting carbon costs and blah 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 it's like making it eco-friendly and things so these are the two things that i'm sort of like how can i connect with the community um and, and by the way is there anyone in bali doing is there anyone like doing aid in bali is there anyone uh there was yet? uh there was a guy about two weeks ago i can't remember his name i could find it but he was in bali as well another australian okay cool uh hanging out okay, in bali cool. i don't know whereabouts yep. in bali but um he was somewhere there yep. uh we actually kind of lost you somewhere in the middle between um okay. the the trading the and the, the fat bikes <laughs> on the beach yeah um yeah that's right so drop dropped out but um so you're crossing a bunch of different things here. Um, so the USDT trading, you know, the trading bot, fine, that's okay, yeah. that's one thing. Um, that works in a number of different functions. Uh, are you doing it via um, an exchange or are you doing it on DeFi-based protocols? Yeah, so the robot is a separate program, but I'm doing it on Binance. So okay, it's right. being done on so, Binance so and Barbie, yeah, Binance and yeah. Barbie, yeah. Right. Okay. So the, the, the key thing here is that that's really got nothing to do with ADA per se, other than that ADA mm. is more value. Mm. Right. Um, you're primarily the points, yeah. using the, um, the, the centralized exchange, such as Binance, to process the orders appropriately and do all that. And they've got all the trading liquidity and depth on those sort of channels. What I don't okay. understand is um, so when you're talking about carbon credits in terms of the fat bikes and people usage and things like that, mm -hmm. it's a whole different area. Yeah, of, incomplete uh, different. Yeah, yeah. Um, of um, while there is carbon trading and the um, uh, there is different. Um, they effectively. I don't, I'm not familiar with all the carbon trading schemes around the world, but. It's certainly like the one they have here in New Zealand is a, 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 a infrequent auction every so often and it's actually mispriced to be honest um, so um, uh, there's certainly an ability to increase liquidity within the carbon sort of space but that is typically dealing with large um, uh, polluters that are using it and have to have buy up uh, carbon credits for their for their purposes um, what I don't understand is the connection between your your doing your bot trading and uh, I presume what you're saying is connecting it into the ADA ecosystem in some way so that people could yeah. you know, ADA in some way. Um, that's rel If that's the case, that's relatively independent of um, ADA or any other blockchain because largely what you're dealing with is just these units that are trading frequently on something like Binance, right? And that's um, that's something you can do the bots and and stuff. And if people are interested in the trading trading side of things, um, then that's to to get a return on investment. Then um, that's cool. I would argue that you're not creating wealth. You're just your edge watch. The notion of wealth is different from the notion of getting a return on investment um, of what you're doing because this is very important. As you're actually taking on risk. And you're arbitraging price differences within exchanges, right? Um, there's arbitrage opportunities all over the place. Uh, you can bring in like the notions of uh, what you're talking about with carbon credits. Um, would tourists, uh, the, the big issue with carbon credits is verification. Um, so your fat bikes on the beach is probably too small at the moment for the cost of verification of those carbon credits and the way most of the ETSs are, are set up aren't geared up for that sort of stuff. 
Um, probably as a business, you could probably start buying up carbon credits and that might be a point of difference for your product. But that, that's the sort of thing. I don't know, has anyone else got any thoughts on, on that? Uh, uh, on sort of things that- um, Someone so was mentioning something about mangrove, mangroves. Sorry, someone was mentioning something to me about mangroves and how that could be connected with carbon credits. Right, well, well, if you want to go into the area of carbon credits, that's all to get uh, something else. Um, mangroves are very important for the ecosystem um, generally. And so there's an encourage, the, the idea is that you want to reinstate mangroves, especially in sort of wetlands. They do quite a lot of filtering of the water but for and um, storing, they're very good for flood protection and stuff going on. So like where Stephen is, there's a lot of mangroves and stuff around those sort of areas. And they actually act as a buffer for a lot of work. So a lot of the mangroves and things were ripped out. That's the thing. And, and so consequently, you're getting a lot of lowland flooding in different areas where they used to be. So uh, there's a lot of a push to push, to replant, to regrow mangroves. And so those are more sort of like impact related investment type of strategies to how can you, we fund the revegetation of mangroves and grow them back over a period of time and report back those sort of things. Um, and there's certainly opportunities to um, increase investment for that. Um, and by increasing liquidity within those sort of markets, and indeed I've, uh, I've got a challenge proposal up um, to try and bring social and environmental financing kind of notions of DeFi into the Cardano space. So bring the ideas of DeFi, which is largely token flipping at the moment, which is what your bot is doing, um, and um, really just pursuing yield. That's what you're after, right? You're just trying to, by flipping your tokens, you, you're trying to pursue yield. But the ideas of um, trying to bring in um, that process of bringing new information into the market, um, which is notionally what trading is supposed to do and are taking advantage of arbitrage. You're supposed to bring new information to the market. That stuff can be applied to social and environmental impact. Um, so the what stuff that we've got appearing at the moment are things like uh, Benjamin's put in here, nat nature-based tokens. There are quite a few of those sort of around. Uh, probably Regen Network is probably one of the um, most preeminent ones on that. There's a few carbon trading coins and things like that um, that have been around for quite a while. Um, but um, so in general, I think there's a huge space to, um, I'm a big advocate of trying to bring new sort of market systems to solve social and environmental problems. Um, I think there's huge benefit in doing that. Uh, because this is the idea of um, where markets are an information system. So if you've got more eyes, more ears, more people coming in uh, to uh, trade and effect, arbitrage opportunities and things like that, then you're producing more information to the market so that we can say, okay, this is important. Okay, this is what we need to do. Um, so Dimitri's just mentioned about solar cookers. So one of the biggest health problems, for example, within a lot of impoverished areas is um, the use of kerosene and stuff to uh, for the cooking and in enclosed areas. And so it actually creates a huge amount of health problems associated with um, women in particular, women and children because of the, the fumes and stuff. So there's been various different efforts around to try and um, bring um, new cooking devices, you know, it's like solar powered ones um, uh, or mirrored based sort of cooking methods to get rid of the use of kerosene um, and other related um, fossil fuel based cooking things to get rid of the pollution inside the house for cooking purposes right? um, and therefore increasing people's health uh, and there's actually proven to be a whole lot of different social outcomes health and social outcomes as a result of just doing something simple like uh, solar cookers so how can you uh, finance the deployment of solar cookers? Right? That's an impact investing question. Um, there's a huge, what I, what I will say is this, is that there's a huge amount of money, institutional money, going into uh, social and environmental investment. It's coming down the pipeline, massive amounts. 
At the moment, um, most of that has been done in what's referred to as ESG or CSR space. So ESG stands for uh, environmental social uh, governance, environmental and social governance, which is focused on how a company manages its environment and social responsibility. And then you've got CSR, which is corporate social response uh, reporting, which is saying, hey, look at us, we've done a great job. The big problem in both those, all those spaces, and what I mentioned too with the fat tire issue, is the data and the reporting. How do you measure the outcomes? Okay. How do you know whether or not uh, the stated outcomes or the stated claims of what was being done is actually valid? Yeah. That's the big challenge. Right? Accountability, traceability of outcomes is the big thing on that. Now, Steve's just gone, so uh, need to go. Into it. Um, so, um, so that's uh, uh, sort of there's big opportunities to do good while still doing your sort of trading and stuff that's going on. Okay, so absolutely agree with that. Uh, it's just it's actually really quite an involved area, and the biggest area is actually issues of uh, data and, and traceability of things. So yeah. Uh, yeah, so the, Benjamin, do you want to, you know, you can, you're chatting away there, Benjamin, why don't you, uh, what are you, what's your thinking around uh, Oracle pools? I'm trying to save my voice here a little bit, you see. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm kind of still learning about this, but I understand because blockchains are very deterministic and it's everything that's on chain, you can trust it sort of confidently to know that what happens on chain is true. But when you need to fetch any off-chain data or computation that happens outside of the blockchain, then you need some source of verifiable information that's coming through. And that's what we use Oracle Networks for now, right? To kind of verify those information, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of getting there at the moment. So Chainlink being the dominant one, and they refer to them as DONs, which I quite like, actually. Centralized uh, Oracle Networks, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I quite like DON. I, I quite like the term yeah. DON. So we got Dow. We use bombs. Ergo as well on Cardano to, to as our Oracle Ergo. Um, so Ergo um, has got oracles on, but most of the Oracle stuff at the moment is to do with price feeds. Okay, uh, so that's to help with the DeFi sort of situation, whereby you've got all these transactions. You don't. You've got liquidity pools as opposed to order books, which is the dominant order books for centralized exchanges, um, liquidity pools for DeFi. What you basically find with, financial data where you could pretty much easily verify like online already that's just not on chain, right? Whereas versus a real world data where it's very, I guess, hard to verify. Yeah, well, there, there's two things here is that because within the DeFi space, uh, and this is there's a distinction, I'll make it, I'll, I'll park this for just a little bit. There's a difference between Ethereum and Cardano in terms of how you approach the architecture of these things. But in Ethereum, is largely you've got all this price data coming through, which is coming from all sorts of different places and it's all on chain. Um, so you need a way to basically aggregate those, right? To get the true price signal, right? Um, that is then fed back into the smart contracts themselves that may cause triggers or other uh, effects to happen. Um, so that stuff has to be done off chain. That's basically because they're going through all the transaction data, aggregating it to get a to uh, um, a price signal in total across all the markets. Now, on a centralized exchange like Binance, they don't have to do that because they've got the order book, right? They've got the, the price of the spot price gives you an indication of the pricing straight away there and then, okay? Um, so most of the Oracle stuff at the moment has focused in that domain. That's where been most of the, the uh, information is. But when you get into derivatives, um, you need uh, other sort of additional information, like simple even things like date, turns out to be a hard problem, right? Uh, because derivatives obviously have a maturity date. They have a time at which they expire, that sort of stuff. If they're doing things like weather derivatives or something, well, then you need to pull in weather data. Um, and so how do you pull all of this sort of stuff off chain? The price stuff, you, there is a certain degree of... Um, uh, auditability in that already because all the data is on chain and you're just pulling it off chain, aggregating it to come up with the universal price feed. But if you go and try and do what is the weather or you know what is the rain, what was the rain level 
in um, you know uh, Kamloops in Canada. You know, well, what is the snow level? Because there's a a um, a um, you know a skiing derivative out there for whatever reason. So um, that the ski fields want to use because they want to know the amount they, they want to offset their income in case it's a bad snow snow uh, fall. Uh, because of climate change, they're getting reduced, so they'll be uh, driven. How do you work out who who says that, you know, what's the level of snowfall? What's the level of rainfall? How do we know? How can we verify it, right? And that's where the DONs are coming in, okay? Um, now, that DONs in the chain link space is geared around the architecture of um, Ethereum and the EVM. What you're seeing in uh, Ergo and any of the extended UTXO models is you've kind of got a hybrid of um, uh, liquidity pool with batching. So you'll start to see, you know, the, I don't know if you saw a lot of the uh, conversations. Uh, are you off Troy, are you? Um, um, so uh, yeah, what Ken was saying here is anything that changes over time is where we need Oracle feeds, right? Um, and so how do you go about doing that? So in Cardano space, what we're starting to see is you're seeing a combination of liquidity pools plus, plus order books. Well, we haven't quite got there yet, but that's where we'll be going. Um, uh, so for a lot of these things. And the Oracle component is something that Ergo, uh, Amergo had developed, uh, Robert Kubernetes, Kubernetes, I can't remember his, Kubernetes or something, worked on, which was called Oracle Pools, okay? So the Oracle Pool idea is very close to Chainlink's DOM idea, okay? Um, and that is actually a way to, um, what you're trying to do is build up reputation about the Oracles that are participating in an Oracle Pool. Um, and you've kind of got the cross-checking going on. So the way I sort of equated when you start looking at how the Oracle pool stuff works, you end up with something like a proof of work or proof of useful work, because now the, the, the members of a Oracle pool are kind of cross-checking each other and you can develop market mechanisms to ensure that the Oracle pools are honest and creating honest signals. And that it's not the only thing. There is a proposal up in, um, Fun six in the developer ecosystem called Orcafax um, to do a specification to basically build up, bring um, authenticity and trustworthiness into Oracle designs. It's coming from a guy who um, has been involved in the digital archiving space for a long time. And you might say, well, how is digital archiving related to um, Oracles? But the reality is you need the same sort of standards, you need the same sort of approach to authenticity, because as Ken pointed out, things are changing over time. And so you need to build up that historical provenance over a period of time. Okay, so that's the sort of thing that's coming through. Yeah, you off, Patrick. Okay. Oh, right. Yeah, no, I'm just uh, replying to Ben's. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Yeah, so um, yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff to be done around oracles at the moment. They're over, to summarize this, uh, overall, they're overridingly focused on um, uh, price feeds at the moment uh, because fundamentally it's a lot harder to get other sort of information to begin with. But the other sort of information right, is really important to social and environmental impact. Right? Uh, and building that up over time. So, yeah, once, and that's what we, what you're effectively doing with the oracles is importing the data such that it can be consumed on chain, whether that's by um, uh, the smart contract stuff themselves, the verifiers in the case of uh, Plutus, uh, or the off chain code that's doing it, but in a way that can be verified by others. And so there's a combination of um, uh, pulling in together data structures that are what are called authenticated data stru structures. So this is using cryptography and stuff to verify that the data hasn't been changed or was submitted by someone. Market mechanisms to ensure that people are trying, uh, there's a cost to being dishonest. 
you know, that sort of thing. So the Oracle pool design is doing that, uh, building up provenance so that you can, you've can you got a historical record so that you could, to verify something, for example, if you've got a verified viable provenance of a data signal, then you can look at it and say, well, hey, this figure seems way out, you know, from historical records. So I'm going to treat it more carefully or my confidence in it will go down. So there's a huge amount of uh, work in this space to do, uh, an opportunity in this space, which is basically importing data from outside, time-varying data from outside on chain so that it can be used by the agents on chain. See you, Dimitri. Are you off? Oh, dinner calling, Matt. <laughs> okay, uh, I've had mine. Uh, nice to see you, Matt, and hopefully it was useful. And uh, likewise, uh, Dimitri. Yeah, that's cool. I'll see you next time then, maybe. Um, so yeah, any uh, that's a little bit about oracles. Uh, I could rabbit on about them for quite a while, but uh, that's uh, that's some things. Yeah, anything else on on that? Any other questions? We're coming up to the sort of yeah, two hours. Um, yeah, go, Patrick. Right. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, stable coins? And um, I I know that. Uh, I think I was just released a paper about a stable coin, um, I think back in August, I think it's called DJ. Um, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about stable coin in the develop, in develop, development um, based in the Cardano ecosystem? Yeah. Um, so I don't know, I haven't researched a lot of the stable coin designs at the moment. So DJ is a paper that's out. I have not read that yet, it's 60 pages. Uh, with Agda proofs and stuff, so I do want to read it. It's right up my alley uh, uh, because it's got sort of balancing and stuff that's going on, but I just have not had a chance to read it. I don't know, Ken, have you read it at all? Have you had a chance to read it? Anyone? <laughs> I don't know. It's about 89 it. pages. Yeah, so have that time to look at. Yeah. Ken? Yeah? I haven't read it too closely. I've taken a look at it. Yeah. Um, so uh, the other stable coin that's coming out, I think, is Liquid, um, but I haven't looked at their design too much. Um, the just was um, like with Tether and things like that, you've got um, you, Tether is kind of like you in the Ethereum space is trust us. We've got this reserve. Uh, we say so, but we're not going to we're not going to let you know how much or what we do to manage it. So it's a bit of a black box there, which is really um, odd. Um, then within um, what we're starting to see now in sort of like version two, um, we're starting to get what are referred to as algorithmic stable coins. Um, so the first lot weren't that great, but now um, algorithmic stable coins are basically taking advantage of the DeFi space to basically um, automatically balance their reserve requirements. Um, and you've got a bigger issue coming through, um, like also, um, I think stable coins, personally, I suspect that stable coins will be um, the target of a lot of uh, regulatory uh, authority fairly quickly. Uh, the, the reason for that is because really the, um, uh, would they, be, no, they, I'll rephrase this. They won't necessarily be the target of regulatory uh, action directly. The thing here is that um, the, Notional idea of a stable coin is the very reason a central bank theoretically exists. I say theoretically because people would argue that they're um, you know, inflating the monetary supply. But largely, if the uh, a central bank's uh, you know central bank uh, digital currency was done as a kind of a stable coin, then um, they would do so with a lot of backing around um, uh, what happens in failure modes, right? In which case. If you are uh, wanting to go and get the risk, you know, you, if you're looking at the risk associated with an on-chain stable coin by some entity, some project out there, versus the on-chain stable coin of a central bank digital currency, you'd probably, everyone would start to gravitate and start using that one because it was less risk associated with it. Um, so, the point being here is that the reason for a central bank is to provide some notion of stability. Uh, that's the reason this 
you know, whether it's an inflationary target of 2% or whatever, that's what they're trying to do. Okay. Um, but what we're seeing is a whole lot of new experiments in stable coins. Um, I've, personally, um, I haven't paid a lot of attention to them because um, I'm the idea, how can I phrase this? The idea that um, you need a stable coin is kind of doesn't sit right with me. I know why. It's it's because of up here people want to have a stable unit of account, but it just doesn't sit right with me. I prefer volatility. And then like what Troy's bot's doing, you know, you're playing around with the volatility. And the software there can just, I can set, you know, in an ideal world, I can set my risk levels, what insurance I need, what income I need, those sort of things. And then I let the software just do the job for me. We're a long way from that, a long way of getting there, but that's what, you know, this idea that everyone is an investor, right, is the big aim. And I don't think we need a stable unit of account, right? on that side of things. Um, yeah. So old habits die hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's right. So other than that, I haven't done a huge amount of research um, into the stable coin area. Uh, it's I've got lots of papers sitting there waiting to get through, but I just haven't done it. So out of all of them, DGED would be the one that's on the top of the list because it ticks my box on a lot of fronts. Cardano, formal methods, um, you know, trading, that sort of stuff. And it's supposed to be quite a good paper, actually, from what people have told me. Have you got any thoughts, Patrick or Benjamin, uh, on that area? No? No? Troy, got anything? Yeah, I'll have to read the white paper to uh, <laughs> understand a bit more. Yeah, put a week aside. Put a week aside to read Yeah. <laughs> I still don't quite understand. Why would Cardano want to create their own stable coin? Uh, well, this was actually done by, um, what's the pseudonym he's doing? Uh, Joachim is his pseudonym. Um, uh, what's his name? I can't remember. It's Benjamin or something. Um, okay, yeah. uh, it was actually done on Ergo uh, as a research project. Um, so um, whether or not it gets done on Cardano, I don't know. I don't know what the plans are on that front. I haven't been tracking it. Um, it so this is very much a research uh, project. What makes this paper interesting is that it's extended UTXO um, and you've got uh, of a smart contract for a stable coin design, which algorithmic stable coin. So it's fluctuating based on trading situations and you've got a full mechanical proof. So formal specification going right through to the active mechanical proofs, which apparently is in the paper, is that right? Um, which is why I'm interested in reading it. Uh, it's because of that. Um, not so much to do with the domain. This is not a light paper to read, um, even for me. Um, it will take me several days to get through this. I mean, it was flipping 60 pages. Um, yeah. And it's, he's got the full egg to proof in there. Cool. So, uh, yeah. If you're not used to reading them, I think you'll read about four pages. <laughs> then give up. But still, on that side. This is Felix. What's, what's up? Uh, So I think yeah. stable coin, it's not really the technical side which is important or interesting. Mostly it's really to say, okay, when you have investors joining cryptocurrencies and you have an extreme change of market volume and whatnot, it doesn't really ensure, let's say, or attracts investors who are really able to bet on a long time run. Because when you have, when you say, okay, you invest in ADA and today it's $2 and tomorrow it can be 50 cents then it isn't the safe harbor for a lot of people. So stablecoin is much more, I think, from a psychological point of view to allow investors to join and to get a first touch already with cryptocurrency and to allow them to have a more secured environment where the invested capital is not confrontated to extreme changes. 
Mm. Absolutely, yeah, it's, it's for this, um, the stable unit of account. Um, I'm more of a derivatives person myself, so um, I see everyone trading in derivatives and you can achieve uh, more tailored results for that. But um, derivatives are for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I definitely agree with you, Robert, because it's it's mostly about trust, providing trust yeah. to users, to people joining in. And I think there can be other solutions than a stable coin. Mm. So for example, when you said allow everybody to become an investor, and I know you are leaning extremely to your N, to the AMM, for example, on the Ben bonding curve. So it allows also a certain kind of trust because it says okay that each project, each whatnot has their own tokens which are also a little bit like a kind of stable coin, but for sure on Cardano, but also a little bit in this own environment. So I think this is there are other possibilities to provide trust. Absolutely, yeah. What I would say is that we, we need the stable coins at the moment um, because just, just the barrier to get into this whole space you know, your volatility, it goes all over the place. Oh, well, no, you've got a thing that's tied to your US dollar or your euro or whatever, so you can rely on that. And people go, oh, okay. So as a bridge, um, we definitely need it. And there will always be a role for it. Um, uh, the, but we can go a lot further than that. Um, and that's going to take a while, right? It is going to take a while for us collectively to understand what we can do, collectively rely on the software. Yeah. Um, to do that is going to be take us ages. Um, so this DJ paper is really important, just purely from that latter point of creating reliable high assurance software. Yeah. This is this is the sort of geekery shit that is really important to do that. And over time people will gain trust in, in that sort of uh, process and the skills to do it. This is not lightweight reading. Yeah. Um, so you know, these, these are the sort of things that our skills will develop over time, I hope. And not everyone's going to need to know these, obviously, but you know, it's like what we were talking about earlier in terms of the scans. We want little check marks to say, hey, this is being verified. I think Charles has been talking a bit about this around high assurance smart contracts, those sort of things. That's what we want to see. And then Troy's bot will look for those and say, oh, ah, well, this has got verified and I can prove that it's been verified. So I'll trade with that unit over there and that one over there. And I've got a reasonable surety that it's going to behave as described. Um, and then that bot then becomes a situation where uh, Troy and all his mates don't even think about stable coins because in a sense the bot is the stable coin uh, because it's just doing all sorts of things under the hoods, trading and taking different positions from different tokens or going into derivative contracts of different kinds of different sort of approaches. But we're a long way from that. Long way. Good, good another good 10, 15 years at best. Yeah. I think the biggest challenge behind this, for example, when we look on fiat, fiat, when you say, for example, stable coin in regard to fiat, for example, fiat is not stable at all. Dollar, euro, whatnot, it's not at all a valid or a stable currency because you don't have a limit. It's up to the central banks and they can print as much as they want. There isn't any limit. So what we see right now, the problem is that there is trust because this value is presented by governance, by nations. And the United States says, for example, okay, I am accountable and you can trust us that the price or the value of dollar is this. Mm. So the problem is not the price of the dollar. The problem is the trust which relies on a currency. Without trust, when we have inflation or deflation, and the society says, for example, okay, I lose the trust to the, uh, to the governance, the value has no, the, the currency doesn't have any value anymore. So the most important part is to make Cardano at system accountable and as trustful enough that 
the price is stable. And then you don't need a stable coin. You just need a trustful society. So this trustless code, because try to, to write a, a contract with the United States of America to say, okay, the dollar has this price. They will never sign this because they know it's totally bullshit. They know, could never be accountable for a contract like this. Well, this is where we have the advantage with the blockchain, I guess. We can um, say, okay. Yes, yes and no. I mean, the monetary theory is no. um, um, so, so most central banks around the world target a 2% inflation rate. Um, and that was pulled out of the, literally pulled out of the butt of the um, finance minister out of New Zealand in the mid 80s and then got adopted around the world, the 2% interest target for central bank inflation rates. Um, and uh, so that's what they're sort of targeting and then they sort of adjusted inflations and stuff like that. I'm not overly familiar with all the modern, modern monetary theory stuff. I haven't done enough reading on it. That's kind of justifying this idea that we can print as much money as we like as long as people are confident in it. Um, the, the reality is that um, most of our um, money, 98% of it worldwide, is credit and debt, effectively. A big component of that is the real estate market. So, you know, we've got this narrative around um, uh, fractional ownership, uh, fractional um, banking. The reality is that banks just create the money out of thin air they, and they're controlled only by the reserve ratios that are required. Um, so most of the money that gets printed is actually getting printed as a result of debt being created, which largely is to do with real estate. Um, there's probably a lot of other sort of stuff going on as well. But, um, so, um, yeah, trust is the big thing. Unit of account is another component here. And, and one of the arguments I put across is that we should all be able to have an individual unit of account. Think of it this way. I could choose to have whatever unit of account I want. You could have your unit of account, but we can easily just trade between each other. Right? Um, I shouldn't have to worry about it. You won't have to worry about it. And the reason for that is that um, we've got these devices like mobile phones that can do a lot of computation for us, whereas previously we didn't. So we had to have payment instruments that were paper-based or coins or, or tally sticks or clay tablets, those sort of things. Whereas now we've got computers connected up their front centre that can do it, yeah. Uh, be bots that trade on Binance, which is what Troy's doing. Yeah. And so therefore balancing things things out for us. Yeah. And ultimately that's that's largely what I mean by everyone will be an investor, is that you know their way of doing things will be through uh, their own notional agent that's trading on their behalf to try and get a sort of position that is secures their income or their livelihood and um, that's what brings you stability not a not a fixed price or a, not a fixed supply um, it's the fact that you've got a lot of people doing uh, revealing their own preferences their own interests their own things into a market which is putting information into a market that is then reacting and it's finding a sort of overall an equilibrium of uh, um, where there's certainty. But of course, that's not going to happen for a long time. But that's, 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 that's actually fundamentally the idea behind a lot of the Austrian economics, is that by people revealing their preferences and trading or through the pricing system, they're putting information into the market. And by doing so, they're increasing everyone's wealth. So the notion of wealth here is different than what Troy was using before. Anyway, I'm trying to avoid very carefully not to go down this rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, Robert, it's, rabbit it's, hole <laughs> it's never possible to, to have a conversation with Robert and not jumping into some fancy rabbit holes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying really hard here. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, that's the problem. You just know too much about your stuff, so it's always a rabbit hole. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I am really trying. <laughs> um, so um, it could become a ro robot, a robot hole if you want to. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, like you're what you're doing, Troy, in terms of like pot trading on Binance. Um, that's kind of a prototypical sort of idea of what I'm getting at. Right. You're working on a centralized exchange primarily because of the performance requirements, and that's where the market depth is, and that's where all the trading mm -hmm. is, right? Um, but as we get more and more exchanges, uh, more things like DEXs, more derivative products, more exotic sort of derivative products coming through. Um, so the, the risk risk adjusted bonding curve one is uh, it's it's a weird beast because it's it's um, it sometimes behaves like uh, equity, sometimes behaves like debt, um, and it can be used as a, a feed into a lot of derivative products. Um, so this idea of different behavior and moving between it is known as dequity. Um, and this is an example of bringing um, trust into the systems now because um, the, the equity is rather um, as well defined and in the sense that it brings discretionary ability to adjust and change course as things change. Whereas debt instruments usually have a fixed set of rules that you gotta pay out. And so they don't adjust particularly well. Um, and uh, so being able to move between the two based on what's actually happening in terms of the outcomes and stuff is quite an interesting instrument in its own right. But it's a good example of the sort of novel and exotic, exotic instruments that we can create now in the blockchain space. And we're only just starting to see some of those on the Ethereum um, network coming through. I mean, there's a few that I find particularly interesting. Um, and uh, no doubt, hopefully we'll see them all on the Cardano network or more interesting because we can do other, um, it's not literally taking exactly the same type of instrument partly because the account-based model versus the UTXO model is quite different, um, but opens up the doors for other forms of stability. So we were talking earlier about the um, Oracle pools, the, the DOMs. Um, that's an example uh, of uh, using market mechanisms and the trading between um, uh, doing work, useful work uh, and trying to position yourself because you've got these defined rules to create value. And because it's been done in a network of um, independent nodes that are working selfishly, you know, trying to, but collectively for a better outcome. And that's just one layer, right? Uh, when you can start to rely on it, you've got your exchanges, you've got your interest rate swaps, you've got whatever, there's a huge amount coming through. Um, we're only just starting. Um, I think I'll leave it there. Now, then, now you're a person that you can apply your controls. I, I'm serious about this because, uh, right. uh, you know, what's sitting on my desk just at the moment right now um, okay. is this. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's see if I can get it. Can I get it? I can't. No. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. Hold on. I'll, I'll turn it. Off. I'll turn off my background because I think you'll be interested in this sure. one. Um, so this one here. Okay, that's nice. Control yeah. techniques for complex networks. Sounds interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So um, in particular, here is like the Lavinoff function is what I'm interested in reading them to bring in stability and stuff like that, which is uh, quite an interesting. Right. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm quite serious when I say a lot of what you've been taught to be a, as an engineer, uh, I, you know, system right. control or process, chemical process, whichever type of engineer, a lot of the mathematics, a lot of the teachings and stuff that you've been taught is 100% directly applicable to this domain. Cool. That's right. All right. And I had one question on the like uh, uh, DEXs, the decentralized uh, exchanges. 
Uh, is there any timeline as to when would be the first uh, decks on Cardano that's going to come up? Something like the Uniswap? Because there have been a couple of names like uh, Sunday Swap and ADAX floating around. But then uh, is there any timeline as such? Um, I presume they'll be coming out fairly soon. I mean, there'll be the look at the interest rate swap sort of market, lending market. Um, Sunday swap, uh, there's mini swap and there's Ugo Dex and there's Meld, there's a whole bunch of Dexes. Uh, Dex is kind of like the Hello World program, initial Hello World for, uh, for smart contracts at the moment. So I expect to see quite a few of those. Um, the devil will be in the detail. Um, so what's happened a couple of weeks ago was a once um, all of a sudden a lot of these Pluto uh, software developers have been exposed to uh, running things on the test net and they found that their designs were somewhat wanting uh, mainly because they're it's this they're seeing all this stuff over on ethereum and saying let's hey let's pull this across and the simplistic thinking of their designs are going oh we'll just run it on uh, this UTXO model. No, it won't. All right. You've got to actually redesign them. So there's a different sort of redesign uh, requirement going on. Um, so like Miniswap, for example, was struggling with, uh, you know, because of their design, uh, they were struggling with, um, uh, see you later, for, uh, Felix. Um, right. um, they were struggling with uh, um, uh, their uh, sort of um, designs and timing out and stuff because the way they've designed things was to basically a naive approach to handling um, concurrency. Um, so I don't know what um, any, I, I've noticed there was some stuff around Meld. They did quite a reasonable um, blog post the other day about how they're approaching the concurrency issue. Um, it was reasonable. Um, I needed to reread it again. I think there's still some problems in it, but um, uh, Sunday Swap, I haven't read anything about where they're at or what they're doing. And no doubt there'll be a bunch of others coming on. So in terms of timeline, I would say it's safe to assume that there'll be starting to be DEXs in the next couple of months, if not this in the next month. I'm sure there'll be some announcements about some stuff at the summit, to be honest. Right, Troy. thank you. Yeah, so do you see, um, uh, this might be a stupid question, but I just thought I'll throw it out there. So do you see these uh, like Sunday Swap or these uh, eight or 12 DEXs um, taking over Binance? Taking over Binance or taking over any of the central exchanges? Um, User experience is a biggie, for starters. Uh, would the, will, will DeFi, the, I think the bigger question here is, will DeFi take over a centralized exchange or centralized fire, what is C fire, whatever you want to call it? Um, yeah, eventually. Timeline? Don't know. Uh, one reason is that, again, just like the stable coin question we had before, existing models are easier to understand for most people. And they kind of like there's there's a, a bit of a theme which is like ah I want to be able to phone up someone when shit goes wrong, right? If I lose my money, I want to phone up and be able to complain. And so I'm used to a company, even if that, even if that company is in China, or is the Chinese roots or something just like that. And I'm outside of it. I want to complain. Um, and that's providing a sort of comfort factor. The user experience of um, DeFi at the moment, and particularly in um, Ethereum, sucks big time. Really does. Uh, part of that is because of the unpredictability, unpredictability of feeds. The trading model is different. Right? Um, you've got pretty much uh, an order block on centralized exchanges. Uh, so you can place your spot price, you can do your spot orders, you can do your limit orders. Uh, the mental model is easier to understand, right? For most people. Um, whereas DeFi, you know, I'm, I'm gonna trade, am I gonna be a liquidity pool? Uh, you know, what about the rest of the fees, the uncertainty of the fees? 
you know, when should I trade? Um, a lot of people go on about the high cost of the fees in Ethereum. I reckon it's actually more the uncertainty of the fees, which is a big problem, which is not so much of a problem if you're a whale and you're doing big movements in DeFi. Um, you've got minor extractable value, which is another problem on Ethereum, uh, which is, isn't such a big deal on the UTXO model unless the exchanges design their protocols badly. Um, they open up the door for a similar sort of idea if they're not careful. Um, uh, but ultimately I would say it's the mental model and the user experience that is the, the limiting factor and whether DeFi versus uh, central finance exchanges. Right. Um, yeah, uh, that, that'll be it. All right, we're coming up to two and a half hours. I might uh, cap it uh, for the night. And uh, thanks for all the conversations and stuff like that. And if you have any more questions or anything else like that, save them for next week. <laughs> Come back in next week, and uh, yeah, we can yeah bring them along. And uh, Naveen, I'll set you an exercise to go off and look and think how you can apply your control system thinking to to uh, to the wonderful world of token mechanics and design. Yeah, I am very serious on uh, definitely. Yeah. Um, so if sure, I'll look into that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that would be very cool. Okay, well, on that side of things, but. Uh, yeah. So hopefully that was worthwhile and um, I'll uh, bid you farewell for the evening and I'll actually go and have an early night for a change. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming thank along. You. And thank uh, you very much. So, uh, really nice meeting you all and uh, be good to see you next week. Okay. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much.